Preface and Chapter 1 of The Loss of the S.S. Titanic, Its Stories and Its Lessons, by Lawrence Beasley. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Allison Hester. The Loss of the S.S. Titanic by Lawrence Beasley. Preface. The circumstances in which this book came to be written are as follows. Some five weeks after the survivors from the Titanic landed in New York, I was the guest at luncheon of Honorable Samuel J. Elder and Honorable Charles T. Gallagher, both well-known lawyers in Boston. After luncheon, I was asked to relate to those present the experiences of the survivors in leaving the Titanic and reaching the Carpathia. When I had done so, Mr. Robert Lincoln O'Brien, the editor of the Boston Herald, urged me as a matter of public interest to write a correct history of the Titanic disaster, his reason being that he knew several publications were in preparation by people who had not been present at the disaster, but from newspaper accounts were piecing together a description of it. He said that these publications would probably be erroneous full of highly colored details and generally calculated to disturb public thought on the matter he was supported in his request by all present and under this general pressure i accompanied him to messrs houghton mifflin company where we discussed the question of publication messrs houghton mifflin company took at that time exactly the same view that i did that it was probably not advisable to put on record the incidents connected with the titanic sinking it seemed better to forget details as rapidly as possible however we decided to take a few days to think about it at our next meeting we found ourselves in agreement again but this time on the common ground that it would probably be a wise thing to write a history of the titanic disaster as correctly as possible I was supported in this decision by the fact that a short account, which I wrote at intervals aboard the Carpathia, in the hope that it would calm public opinion by stating the truth of what had happened as nearly as I could recollect it, appeared in all the American, English, and colonial papers, and had exactly the effect it was intended to have. This encourages me to hope that the effect of this work will be the same. Another matter aided me in coming to a decision. The duty that we, as survivors of the disaster, owe to those who went down with the ship, to see that the reforms so urgently needed are not allowed to be forgotten. Whoever reads the account of the cries that came to us afloat on the sea from those sinking in the ice-cold water must remember that they were addressed to him just as much as to those who heard them and that the duty of seeing that reforms are carried out devolves on every one who knows that such cries were heard in utter helplessness the night the titanic sank end of preface chapter one construction and preparations for the first voyage the history of the RMS Titanic of the White Star Line is one of the most tragically short it is possible to conceive. The world had waited expectantly for its launching and again for its sailing, had read accounts of its tremendous size and its unexampled completeness and luxury, had felt it a matter of the greatest satisfaction that such a comfortable and above all such a safe boat had been designed and built the unsinkable lifeboat and then in a moment to hear that it had gone to the bottom as if it had been the veriest tramp steamer of a few hundred tons and with it fifteen hundred passengers some of them known the world over the improbability of such a thing ever happening was what staggered humanity. If its history had to be written in a single paragraph, it would be somewhat as follows. The RMS Titanic was built by Messrs. Harland and Wolfe at their well-known shipbuilding works at Queen's Island, Belfast, side by side with her sister ship, the Olympic. 
the twin vessels marked such an increase in size that specially laid out joiner and boiler shops were prepared to aid in their construction and the space usually taken up by three building slips was given to them the keel of the titanic was laid on march thirty first nineteen o nine and she was launched on may thirty first nineteen eleven she passed her trials before the board of trade officials on march thirty first nineteen twelve at belfast arrived in southampton on april fourth and sailed the following wednesday april tenth with two thousand two hundred eight passengers and crew on her maiden voyage to new york she called at cherbourg the same day queenstown thursday and left for new york in the afternoon expecting to arrive the following wednesday morning but the voyage was never completed she collided with an iceberg on sunday at eleven forty five p m in latitude forty one degrees forty six north in longitude fifty degrees fourteen west and sank two and a half hours later eight hundred fifteen of her passengers and six hundred eighty eight of her crew were drowned and seven hundred five rescued by the carpathia such is the record of the titanic the largest ship the world had ever seen she was three inches longer than the olympic and one thousand tons more in gross tonnage and her end was the greatest maritime disaster known the whole civilized world was stirred to its depths when the full extent of loss of life was learned and it has not yet recovered from the shock and that is without doubt a good thing it should not recover from it until the possibility of such a disaster occurring again has been utterly removed from human society whether by separate legislation in different countries or by international agreement no living person should seek to dwell in thought for one moment on such a disaster except in the endeavor to glean from it knowledge that will be of profit to the whole world in the future when such knowledge is practically applied in the construction equipment and navigation of passenger steamers and not until then will be the time to cease to think of the titanic disaster and of the hundreds of men and women so needlessly sacrificed a few words on the ship's construction and equipment will be necessary in order to make clear many points that arise in the course of this book a few figures have been added which it is hoped will help the reader to follow events more closely than he otherwise could the considerations that inspired the builders to design the titanic on the lines on which she was constructed were those of speed weight of displacement passenger and cargo accommodation high speed is very expensive because the initial cost of the necessary powerful machinery is enormous the running expenses entrailed very heavy and passenger and cargo accommodation have to be fined down to make the resistance through the water as little as possible and to keep the weight down an increase in size brings a builder at once into conflict with the question of dock and harbor accommodation at the ports she will touch if her total displacement is very great while the lines are kept slender for speed the draft limit may be exceeded the titanic therefore was built on broader lines than the ocean racers increasing the total displacement but because of the broader build she was able to keep within the draft limit at each port she visited at the same time she was able to accommodate more passengers and cargo and thereby increase largely her earning capacity the vessel when completed was eight hundred eighty three feet long ninety-two and one-half feet broad her height from keel to bridge was one hundred four feet she had eight steel decks a cellular double bottom five and one-fourth feet through the inner and outer skins so called and with bilge keels projecting two feet for three hundred feet of her length amidships these latter were intended to lessen the tendency to roll in a sea they no doubt did so very well, but
but as it happened they proved to be a weakness for this was the first portion of the ship touched by the iceberg and it has been suggested that the keels were forced inwards by the collision and made the work of smashing in the two skins a more simple matter not that the final result would have been any different her machinery was an expression of the latest progress in marine engineering being a combination of reciprocating engines with Parsons' low-pressure turbine engine, a combination which gives increased power with the same steam consumption, an advance on the use of reciprocating engines alone. The reciprocating engines drove the wing propellers and the turbine amid propeller, making her a triple screw vessel. To drive these engines, she had 29 enormous boilers, and 159 furnaces. Three elliptical funnels, 24 feet 6 inches in the widest diameter, took away smoke and water gases. The fourth one was a dummy for ventilation. She was fitted with 16 lifeboats, 30 feet long, swung on davits of the Whelan double acting type. These davits are specially designed for dealing with two and were necessary three sets of lifeboats i e forty eight altogether more than enough to have saved every soul on board on the night of the collision she was divided into sixteen compartments by fifteen transverse watertight bulkheads reaching from the double bottom to the upper deck in the forward end and to the saloon deck in the after end in both cases well above the water line Communication between the engine rooms and boiler rooms was through watertight doors, which could all be closed instantly from the captain's bridge. A single switch, controlling powerful electromagnets, operated them. They could also be closed by hand with a lever, and in case the floor below them was flooded by accident, a float underneath the flooring shut them automatically. These compartments were so designed that if the two largest were flooded with water, a most unlikely contingency in the ordinary way, the ship would still be quite safe. Of course, more than two were flooded the night of the collision, but exactly how many is not yet thoroughly established. Her crew had a complement of 860, made up of 475 stewards, cooks, etc., 320 engineers, and 65 engaged in her navigation. The machinery and equipment of the Titanic was the finest obtainable and represented the last word in marine construction. All her structure was of steel, of a weight, size, and thickness greater than that of any ship yet known. The girders, beams, bulkheads, and floors all of exceptional strength it would hardly seem necessary to mention this, were it not that there is an impression among a portion of the general public that the provision of Turkish baths, gymnasiums, and other so-called luxuries involved a sacrifice of some more essential things, the absence of which was responsible for the loss of so many lives. But this is quite an erroneous impression. All these things were an additional provision for the comfort and convenience of passengers, and there is no more reason why they should not be provided on these ships than in a large hotel. There were places on the Titanic's deck where more boats and rafts could have been stored without sacrificing these things. The fault lay in not providing them, not in designing the ship without places to put them on whom the responsibility must rest for their not being provided is another matter and must be left until later. When arranging a tour round the United States, I had decided to cross in the Titanic for several reasons. One, that it was a rather novelty to be on board the largest ship yet launched, and another, that friends who had crossed in the Olympic described her as a most comfortable boat in a seaway and it was reported that the titanic had been still further improved in this respect by having a thousand tons more built in to steady her i went on board at southampton at ten a m wednesday april tenth after staying the night in the town 
it is pathetic to recall that as i sat that morning in the breakfast room of a hotel from the windows of which could be seen the four huge funnels of the titanic towering over the roofs of the various shipping offices opposite and the procession of stokers and stewards winding their way to the ship there sat behind me three of the titanic's passengers discussing the coming voyage and estimating among other things the probabilities of an accident at sea to the ship as i rose from breakfast i glanced at the group and recognized them later on board but they were not among the number who answered to the roll call on the carpathia the following monday morning between the time of going on board and sailing i inspected in the company of two friends who had come from exeter to see me off the various decks dining saloons and libraries and so extensive were they that it is no exaggeration to say it was quite easy to lose one's way on such a ship we wandered casually into the gymnasium on the boat deck and were engaged in bicycle exercise when the instructor came in with two photographers and insisted on our remaining there while his friends as we thought at the time made a record for him of his apparatus in use it was only later that we discovered that they were the photographers of one of the illustrated london papers more passengers came in and the instructor ran here and there looking the very picture of robust rosy-cheeked health and fitness in his white flannels placing one passenger on the electric horse another on the camel while the laughing group of onlookers watched the inexperienced riders vigorously shaken up and down as he controlled the little motor which made the machines imitate so realistically horse and camel exercise it is related that on the night of the disaster right up to the time before the titanic sinking while the band grouped outside the gymnasium doors played with such supreme courage in face of the water which rose foot by foot before their eyes the instructor was on duty inside with passengers on the bicycles and the rowing machines still assisting and encouraging to the last along with the bandsmen it is fitting that his name which i do not think has yet been put on record it is macaulay should have a place in the honorable list of those who did their duty faithfully to the ship and the line they served. End of chapter 1